Okay. Yeah. I need a time then. I'll give you 15, 10, 5, 2, 1. Yep. Thank you. So our uh, next speaker is a computer science student at the University of New South Wales. Today he's going to be talking about source code generation. Please welcome Daniel Phillips. Hi everyone, great to be here. Uh, this is my first LinuxConf, um, and today I'll be talking to you about source code generation. Um, now, what's the problem? Suppose you have some kind of interface uh, could be an API, it could be a DB interface, it could be uh, a file format or a serialization format, um, and you need to consume it or implement it. Um, doing this might require a lot of boilerplate, a lot of repetitive code, uh, and it might be very large, so it's a lot of boilerplate to maintain, um, and it might change a lot as well. Or maybe you just have a lot of boilerplate to write, um, could, which could easily be represented by uh, a bit of code in a, in a domain-specific language. Um, possible solutions to this problem. Just write the boilerplate. Uh, not particularly fun. Find someone else to write the boilerplate. Um, maybe you don't trust that person. I don't know. Um, also, it consumes a bit of time. Or you just get a computer to write it. Write a program to write the boilerplate. Why would we want to do that? Um, so one example is code, uh, one reason is code deduplication. Um, it's not quite deduplication because the code still exists, but uh, it has most of the same benefits. Um, you end up with fewer developer mistakes, uh, saves a lot of time, um, and if you need to change a small thing in your generated code, it's very easy to do so. Uh, can also uh, help encourage best practices. So uh, since a human isn't writing a boilerplate, you'll end up with very consistent, uh, very consistent code. Um, a human isn't writing it, uh, so they won't introduce creative things. Um, you can introduce uh, whatever idioms you might think are suitable um, and avoid, yeah, avoid developer laziness contributing to mistakes again. Um, if you're in a static statically typed language, uh, it's very helpful to have automatically generated types as well. So other reasons, um, you can fairly easily co-generate tests. Uh, and uh, if, um, mainly in the case of APIs, you can have good interop um, You can easily establish interoperability between different languages if you uh, write different co-generators for those languages and use the same DSL between them. Um, also kind of uh, useful in the case of databases because you might want to be replacing uh, some application or other one. Um, so a bit of history. Um, so prime example is WSDL, uh, Web Services Description Language. Um, was designed by IBM and Microsoft back in early 2000s, uh, XML-based. Um, not really human-readable. So you end up with a service discovery type workflow where um, an application will be compiled uh, with the WSDL, so by which I mean, suppose you have the class definitions of all of your shapes and whatnot for your API. Um, WSDLs are generated from that. Um, service is deployed with the WSDL being served. Um, and anyone who's a developer trying to write client software for this uh, fetches it. Um, this is what, uh, and yeah, there's a code generator that actually takes it and generates a client for you. Um, now, Visual Studio and Eclipse and all of, all of the big ideas do this um, built in. Um, this is what WSDL looks like. It's a bit hard to read, uh, just, so, just in case you didn't know what WSDL looked like. Um, more recent thing, so OpenAPI, um, formerly known as Swagger, uh, started being developed around 2010. Um, a lot more human readable. Um, so you can, rather than having a, a code first kind of development model, you can start with your schema for your API. Um, and documentation can be generated from that as well. Uh, here's an example bit of, oh, didn't quite render right. Um, example bit of OpenAPI description language. Um, 
probably can't read that very well, but it's a lot, you can tell that it's already a lot nicer than Wisdle, um, and it's something you'd actually want to write. Um, a couple of other things, uh, so there's serialization formats have their own code generators as well. Apache Thrift, um, Twitter made their own code generator for this because they didn't like Apache's one, because uh, they're like, oh yeah, it works with Scala. Um, but really it was just a Java thing that they were expecting to uh, pull across. Um, that's a recurring theme in this talk. Uh, I'll, get to, I'll get more on Scala in a moment. Um, so, and there's also Google protocol buffers, which has uh, been around in, internally at Google since the early 2000s, but was released public in 2008. Um, and GNU Autogen is kind of a meta code generator. Um, you'll see that a lot in uh, open source projects written in C um, or C++. So a few design principles to talk about. Um, uh, so generated code should be stateless. You should never, ever commit generated code. It's a part of your build process, the, the code generation stage. Um, and yeah, it should just entirely be a function of whatever schema you have to generate it from. Um, so I've seen horror stories of people uh, committing the generated code, then editing the generated code uh, until it becomes so hard to deal with that uh, if you try to regenerate the code, it'll break everything. You do not want that. You really do not want that. Um, another point uh, is kind of relevant to the Wisdom example. Um, so you need a version in your schemas. Uh, either they just keep it under source control, um, or if you're fetching it externally, uh, keep it under source control. Um, but if you're not going to do that, you need to have some kind of versioning scheme. Uh, you don't want your build process to be non-deterministic or determined by some external entity. Um, generated can be a little bit hacky. Uh, it's not a huge problem. Um, generated code doesn't really need to be too readable. Um, uh, performance is generally more valued than style in your generated code. Um, so, uh, and yeah, you may also just need a small part of your DSL. You don't have to implement the entire parser for your complete DSL. Um, and you're not really running a compiler here, you're just running a code generator, so just keep that in mind. Um, shouldn't be too hacky. Uh, recursive descent parsers, a uh, little bit of compiler theory. Um, much, much better than using regular expressions because regular expressions often don't parse your language completely. Um, obviously, if that's not the case, go ahead and use regular expressions, but in most cases, your language will need a recursive descent parser. Um, don't be one of those people who go around uh, grepping bits of XML to pull data out. Um, make sure you understand the semantics of the DSL as well. So this bit of SQL uh, you're creating an index. Is that part of the state of the schema? In this case, most certainly, because it's a unique index, um, you're, adding, you're not only adding an index, you're adding a constraint. That's just one example of something that might trip you up. Um, so Adobe CodeGen is a piece of software um, written by my employer. Um, uh, it generates uh, database code for a framework called Doobie, um, for Scala, written in Scala, et cetera, uh, and it's, an MIT, it's MIT licensed. A um, bit of background about Doobie, so it's a very thin layer of uh, SQL and JDBC, um, very good with Postgres. Uh, connection, so a few, few features. It's, it's designed to be for functional uh, programming style. Um, so has a connection IO monad, um, so it's very easy to control uh, transactions. Um, and there's also automatic uh, type serialization and deserialization. So you see here I've got a tuple of, uh, containing another tuple. Not that this is good style, but uh, this is just, uh, this, will, this ID will go here, username will go here, password will go here, just to demonstrate the power of Doobie. Um, so rationale for this code generator. Uh, Scala options were kind of limited. Um, as they often are. Uh, Java options were not really very nice to work with in Scala. Um, so, and we also have a 
preference for lower level database, lowish level uh, database interfacing. In other words, not with an ORM, so we can actually tell exactly what's going on and tune things for performance and, and so on more easily. Um, and we were using Doobie, and we found that uh, our DB code was becoming a little bit difficult to maintain. Uh, mistakes introduced. Uh, basically, all the reasons that I mentioned uh, before um, regarding maintainability. Um, so here's a bit of generated code, uh, roughly, from DB code gen. Um, so you've got your ID type. That's the, the new type idiom, I suppose. Um, basically, if, if that type, if that object exists, you're very sure that the value inside it is in the database. You don't really want to uh, instantiate that yourself. Um, row uh, has everything in the database row uh, and will often uh, here assigning things. Actually, that one doesn't quite make sense. But um, shape, um, sorry, the, the, the default argument here doesn't quite make sense because you're not going to be uh, not really going to be assigning a row, um, but the shape you are, shape is exactly what you need to give to the um, generated functions in order to create a row. Um, now, excludes the ID because it's usually automatically generated. It also excludes uh, anything you want it to. So you could also exclude uh, things like created at fields where they default to the current timestamp. Um, so yeah, these are the different functions we have. So there's create with the args, create with the shape. Um, get by ID or find by the, uh, is this still working? Oh, yep. Find by the long, uh, find by the primitive value of what the ID is. Um, this one, since you, the ID means that it's already in the database, it just returns back a row. Um, in this one, it turns back an option row. Yep. Um, we generate uh, a get by field for every foreign key. Um, and we also just have an update function. No deletion, um, part, partly because we uh, don't like it, basically. Um, we prefer a more functional way of going about uh, databases. So uh, not that you can't just write your own delete, um, but we discourage it by not including it in the generator. Um, so you've also got the bulk functions to reduce uh, round trips, um, you've got your create many, multi-get, and multi-get by foreign key, and the all and count we don't use so much. Um, no bulk update, because it doesn't make that much sense to have a bunch of rows that you're updating by um, ID. So to clarify how this update works, actually, um, what it does is it takes, uh, takes a row, um, but it's ex the expectation is it's an existing row that you've modified some of the fields in. Um, the ID stays the same. Um, and that way it updates by the ID. Uh, so you've also got uh, various column options um, to, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, you can have it not write uh, a field, um, so it'll write the default field in. Um, this is useful for created at fields, for example, and there's also always insert default, useful for modified fields where you don't want to manually set it in the first instance, but if you update it, you might want to actually change it. Um, so here's, uh, here's an example of a bit of code before, uh, uh, before we had a code generator. Now, this isn't the worst bit, um, but uh, what, what we might have done is we have tuples with the row, uh, as the row type. Not very pleasant to work with. Um, and we'll have this. Uh, big piece of SQL with a whole bunch of uh, fields in the select statement. Um, not very maintainable because if you need to add more fields to that table, you have to go through all of the queries that, that list all of these out. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, just imagine, imagine this but 10 times worse. Um, imagine 10 tuple types. Uh, imagine you're trying to fit the results of the tuples into another type, which is your HTTP shape, um, your API shape. Uh, that's how bad this code would get. Um, so we introduced, uh, when we introduced code generator generation, um, we also introduced a few idioms. So you've got expanded shapes, which are just a bunch of uh, rows in one case class. Um, when you're writing custom queries, 
which I call the nuclear option, uh, you can um, you can fetch an entire row if you want, if you really need to reduce the round trips. But the preferred method of going about this is to um, just fetch the IDs. That way, you can take the IDs, use a multi-get to uh, fetch the rows, and it won't matter if something has changed in the table. Um, the code will still work. You won't have to change much. Um, and so anything fetched from the, the DB will either be a row or a primary key type. Uh, you don't want tuples fetching. Uh, you don't want to fetch tuples. It's not a, not a very clean way of going about it. Um, so here's the code that's been refracted a little bit. Um, you've got an expanded type now. Um, you've got a query function. It's private because uh, of uh, compiler efficiency reasons. But um, uh, so you fetch the IDs from this function, um, or all of your purchases after this timestamp. Um, you fetch the full rows, then you fetch the user rows based on the foreign key. Um, and the thing about multi-get is uh, it maintains the order of IDs that you pass in. Um, so you can just zip the two together and then turn them into two expanded shapes. Um, now, this is a little bit contrived just to fit on the screen, basically. But uh, we also have uh, we also tend to write functions that do the expansion for us, so we don't have to rewrite the whole expansion thing down here. Um, this is where it gets a bit interesting. So Scala is uh, a language filled with um, implicit values, and this is very taxing on the compiler. So what we found uh, was that generated database queries were very slow to compile. Sorry. Database queries in general were very slow to compile because it had to try and find how to serialize or deserialize the shape. It took us a while to actually work out how to go about doing this, but the first thing we tried was we tried privately scoping all of the, um, all of the functions, gained a bit of performance there, um, merged similar queries. Uh, so uh, this particular idiom pops up in generated code where if you have uh, a parameter that is empty, um, just ignore the rest of the statement. Um, can wreak a little bit of havoc with the query planner of Postgres sometimes, but uh, I'll digress. Um, and we also uh, added options to exclude certain queries that weren't being used. Um, eventually, we realized uh, if you make the types explicit, then the compiler doesn't spend all that time. And it's a very, very messy looking code. But in the end, it doesn't really matter too much because we're not writing it. The code generated is. Um, and it's a lot, lot faster to, com to compile. Um, and a lot less buggy. Uh, we also have a little trick where if a multi-get takes zero arguments, we just avoid the round trip. Um, so we made a few little mistakes. Um, we found that uh, we would be using the expanded types, the row types, a little bit too much. Um, so one example is uh, I had a validation function um, that took in an expanded shape uh, to validate whether it was ready for processing or whatever. Um, but we also had a way of uploading, uh, uploading these shapes via CSV, um, and we wanted to do validation then. So one of the developers, because uh, we were time pressured, just took the expanded shape, populated it themselves, um, and we ended up with DB code not uh, DB shapes existing where there weren't any DB rows, which is not particularly nice. Um, so you don't really want these types to be misused. Uh, so that's, that's something we, sh we should have kept an eye on. Um, the other thing is, DB code gen will read in all of the schema migration scripts, every single one, um, and try to keep up with the state transitions. Uh, it works fine, um, but it seems a little bit unnecessary to go through all that work in hindsight, mainly because Postgres will do that for you. You can give the schema migrations to Postgres, and you can pull out a much more simplified schema, which is just full of create tables, et cetera. Um, so it, it's part of the build process anyway. It's part of the testing process anyway. Um, so it isn't really adding too much overhead to just do that. Um, so to conclude, uh, don't be afraid of source code generation. Um, even if your generated code ends up looking a bit hacky, if you follow uh, good practice, you can make it maintainable. 
um, pay close attention to which idioms you encourage because that will, uh, that will have uh, a long-term flow-on effect throughout all the, all the code the developers write. Um, and yeah, main thing, don't ever commit generated code. If there's anything you should get out of this, don't ever do that. Um, quickly on Doobie code gen, uh, if you want to use it, I recommend you, modify, uh, you actually get involved in the development of it because uh, it is very specific to our needs right now. Um, so uh, yeah, if, uh, if you don't want to have to write do we, if you don't have to, want to have a write generated code, uh, code generator um, in your next Scala project, then I recommend just using an ORM. But uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this, uh, if you think it could pay off, um, go ahead, but very much recommend uh, modifying things as you see fit. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, is Alison Chapman in here at the moment? Can you come here and plug in? And that'll give us some time to take some questions for Daniel while we swap our speakers over. Anyone got any questions? OK, so you first, then you. Hi. Um, do you have any uh, advice on uh, helping to debug generated code? My my experience has been like using generated code is great until it's not, and like you hit it in the debugger and it makes your life really painful. Right. Um, so in our particular case, uh, since it's SQL, we can just turn on Postgres logging. Um, that tends to work fairly well, assuming we don't merge the queries together like we've been doing recently. Um, so uh, I recommend possibly including an option to log in your generated code. Um, and uh, also make sure you automatically generate tests as well, because that, uh, <laughs> that will reduce the incidence of bugs. OK, we have one over here. Um, so what are you using to actually generate the code itself? Are you just like string interpolation, or are you using something like Sorry? Scalameter? String, string so comparison? Uh, sorry, to generate the code, are you using string manipulation, or are you oh, actually no. using Scalameter or something similar? We've we we use a recursive descent parser tool chain, basically. Um, it's within Scala. I don't remember the exact name of it. Uh, if you want, you can uh, you can take a look at the, the source. I don't have the link up there. Uh, just Google Doobie code gen. Um, we yeah, it's a, it's a recursive descent parser. Um, is that, is that, yep. Uh, any more questions here? Ah, uh, up the back, damn it. <laughs> Are you recommending this just for SQL or? Um, like, in my experience, uh, automatically generated code is not better than stuff that people actually architect. Right. Um, so I'm not recommending this just for SQL. Uh, there already exist uh, code generators for things like Thrift um, that have been working quite well. Um, what specific problems? Oh, uh, no, move down here. Um, so I need to know the specific problems you're having. Uh, Chris, do you want to go back up quickly? Sorry? Do you want to go back up? I've got a Clarification. Uh, no? No. No. Okay. Um, you get your shot. <laughs> I, I, found, I found it to work quite well. Uh, um, by, like, uh, it works very well for serialization formats as well. Like, I, I don't know how, what else to add without knowing specific things um, about your problems that you've had. Perhaps have a chat in the hallway after the talk. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. That sounds like a good idea. Hey, everybody, please thank Daniel for a, a great talk about code generation. <laughs>